Good evening, YouTube. Glad to see you on this amazing, glad to be back, glad to be doing my 26th YouTube Live on this awesome December 12th, at the end of December 12th, 2022. I'm grateful to join you after a, a little bit of a hiatus, about three weeks I took off because I was finishing a move. I'm glad to finish that move now. And I just want to talk about um, the success I had with Dr. Jared Ball uh, from Black Power Media on being able to complete this in interesting book we finished together. We read two chapters a week um, from November to this past Saturday. Every Saturday at 9 a.m., uh, me and Dr. Jared Ball talked about this important book. And I did it because, you know, all this talk about anti-Semitism, people being accused of being anti-Semitic. What is anti-Semitism? Certainly this author, Neil Gabler, was not anti-Semitic by writing a book about the Jews, um, about how they came from a culture that was Jewish. Uh, but in terms of the work that they churned out, the movies that these Jews who owned the Hollywood studios, um, the Warners, the Zucors, the Cones who owned Columbia, you know, they were not anti-Semitic uh, because their, their, the work was not Jewish, but that didn't make the work anti-Semitic. So I found it important in such a time as this to really read this book in its entirety. And I'm grateful um, Dr. Jared Ball joined me for the past five weeks, five to six weeks from November um, to December. And we were able to finish this. You can catch each of those videos about one to two hours each of them on my IG, which is um, at Rome Fraser. So we had a great talk. Um, I wanted to just highlight three particular parts of this particular book that, that really spoke to me. Um, yes, there were three particular parts of this book that spoke to me. Um, one from the ninth chapter, another from the 10th chapter, and then the last part that really spoke to me was from the epilogue. So I'd like to share each of those parts with you. And if you're just watching this, please like, share, and subscribe. Like, share, and subscribe. Um, like, share, and subscribe. This is my 26th YouTube. Um, I'm seeing a lot of people come after me um, and get so many comments. So don't hesitate. Please, if you're watching this, comment, comment, comment. Comments are welcome. Please like it. Um, I also want to talk about Irene Kara since my last YouTube live, Irene Kara Paston. I really underestimated how much her impact when I went back to look at her work. And I remember what I was feeling when I first saw her. As I see it a second time, how I was affected by her acting. Not only in the original Sparkle, the 1976 film, but in the 1978 Roots, The Next Generation. Her work in that was like, whoa. It was creepy how whatever she emoted or expressed, whatever emotion she expressed, I felt. And I wanted to write after watching her, because I first saw Roots, The Next Generation, must have been in 20, 2002 when I was teaching an African-American history class at Delaware County Community College. One of my students, God bless her, wherever she is now, her name is Cynthia. And she came up to me and said, Dr. Fraser, have you seen Roots the Next Generation? Or have you seen, and then she gave me the DVD of not only the original Roots, but she gave me the DVD of Roots the Next Generation. And I sat down and I saw it all in its entirety. And um, I tell you, Irene Kara left an indelible mark on me, um, especially in Roots the Next Generation. So I'll, I'll touch on what specifically she did. Um, and also the way she stood up, the way she was okay with um, having her work completely ignored after Flashdance because she chose to stand up for herself and stand up to the Hollywood moguls, people like the Holly, people in the same class as the Hollywood moguls I read about in this book, how the Jews invented Hollywood. For some reason, the light is not allowing me to see, but if I can get, there I go. 
if I can get um, the book a little closer to the camera, you can see the title. The title is An Empire of Their Own, How the Jews Invented Hollywood. I want to look at two particular parts, um, particularly, yes, this is the first part I wanted to look at. This is in the eighth chapter, actually the ninth chapter. I want to make sure I get the numbers right. Um, the ninth chapter called Refugees and British Actors. This is the part where Gabler talks about how when a lot of the writers, because I'm a stage writer, so part of why I liked re reading this part was because this was the part where Gabler was talking about writers. And I am a writer for the stage. I'm a writer for the stage. He mentioned how the writers from New York and Dr. Jared Ball, and I also mentioned this in our very last YouTube live, the way that when writers come from New York to California, where the film industry really was, they changed or it changed them. That was a point that Jared Ball made this past Saturday, that when you choose to be in part of that industry, your radical ideas, that the white communist writers had all go away because you have to work for industry. Um, and this particular part speaks to that in the ninth chapter called Refugees and British Actors. I'm trying to identify, Gabler doesn't identify the exact screenwriter here. He says, we're up to our necks in politics and morality now one screenwriter lamented. Nobody goes to anybody's house anymore to sit and talk and have fun, period. There's a master of ceremonies and a collection basket. There are no gatherings now except for a good cause. We have almost no time to be actors and writers these days. We're committee members and collectors and organizers and audiences for orators. Writing in the New Republic, Ella Winter concurred. There is hardly a tea party today or a cocktail gathering, um, a studio lunch table or dinner even at a producer's house at which you do not hear agitated dictation, decision, talk of freedom and suppression, talk of tyranny and the constitution of war, of world economy and political theory. And so that's how um, Hollywood can write the joy out of you. Hollywood can change you as a writer and make you lose the joy because it's so focused on the formula. And Gabriel absolutely conveyed that. So that was absolutely, I recommend this book. Um, I, I mean, he, he turns it into a narrative. It was well written in the New York, not in New York, in the Los Angeles Times about um, the enduring meanings. And one of those which we, re we reiterated, me and Dr. Jared Ball in the past five, um, Saturdays that we've talked about this book is this overwhelming, this weaning, this albatross, this elephant in the room um, desire for all of the moguls to aspire to be um, in the Anglo-Saxon aristocracy and how the films they produced portrayed that, how the films they produced portrayed that. So it was a powerful moment. Um, I'm not going to capture every single detail and every single tidbit that I learned from this book, but I recommend this book and I thank Neil Gabler for writing it because for me, it balanced it balanced all the anti-Semitism hysteria that last month I have felt more than any other month in my life in the public discourse. I had to just, I had to just work. I had to work at really muzzling myself because there was so much in the media, in the mainstream media about anti-Semitism. So I said, let me just look at what a liberal writer would have to say about how the Jews, in fact, did invent Hollywood um, and how they did it. Because as I mentioned to Dr. Jared Ball earlier, Hollywood is an idea. It is not set in stone. It's not um, spiritual law. It is not um, the Holy Bible. It is not the Quran. 
it is an idea and it is part of culture that tries to become part of our collective subconscious. And as long as we're aware of that, we will not fall for those um, self-destructive patterns that can become part of our uh, subconscious thinking. So I, again, I thank Dr. Jared Ball for joining me over the past six weeks on this amazing, I'm very proud to have done this with him on these uh, amazing book discussion we had Saturdays at 9 a.m. Um, second section of the book, before I completely leave it, is in the, oh yes, the end of the ninth chapter. This is when, this is the very second to last page of the ninth chapter. And Gabler quotes a screenwriter, Jerome Chodorov. They were frightened to death. He's talking about the moguls. He's talking about um, Cone of Columbia, um, Meyer of MGM. Um, he's talking about Warner, the Warner, literally the two Warner Brothers, um, Harry and Jack of, 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 of Warner Brothers Studios. He's talking about all these moguls and Gabler quotes Charteroff saying, and the so-called power was nothing, you know. The American Legion was the front, Charteroff says. They were going to picket the theaters and they were going to get you out of business if you didn't fire people. And of course, it was a joke, you know. The American Legion would have sent up one picket line for an hour and that would have been the end of that. But the producers were the most frightened people in the world. The producers were the most frightened people in the world. And I think for someone to have so much capital, because the producers have the capital to make the films, without the producer, the film would not be made. And so Chodorov raises an important point about the power of the producer and how similar to the stock market, similar to the emotions that drive the stock market, it's run by fear. It's a stressful situation. If you've ever visited the New York stock market, I've passed by often when I used to work at um, WBAI radio. If you ever take the four or five train, Lexington Avenue line to Wall Street, you have to walk and you pass the New York Stock Exchange going from um, going from the Wall Street stop um, of the four and the five to, um, what's the name of that building? It's the building right near the East River. Um, the big building where WBAI was, that's where I used to work. And I would just, you know, if you want, you could stop and just look at the stress that it takes to run you know, to work as a stockbroker on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, that kind of feeling of being frightened is exactly what um, Gabler quotes Chodorov feeling. The producers are the most frightened people in the world, he writes. If you're watching my YouTube live, this is my 26th one, welcome back. Uh, please give me a Cash App donation. It will be most appreciated. My Cash App is dollar sign. Rowan Fraser, R-H-O-N-E-F-R-A-S-E-R. -E -E I definitely appreciate a love donation if you've learned something you didn't know before. So Chodorov, uh, um, Gabler calls Chodorov saying that producers are the most frightened people, but they're the most powerful ones. One of the reasons I love this country and I love films, and I especially love theater more than film, is because theater is an opportunity for cultures of um, producers of different cultures to come together on a project they care about. For example, Alice Childress's play Wedding Band um, brought Joseph Papp, a very established white man who ran the public theater with Alice Childress, a black woman born in South Carolina to come together, right? And then theater also brought Woody King Jr born in Michigan um, and worked odd jobs, but because he believed in theater, he believed in theater and who also believed in theater is Joseph Papp. Because of theater, two people from different backgrounds came together. But even in the coming together, you still have this, there needs to be an emotional connection that will produce the play. 
So if one of the producers is too emotionally off, the play will not be produced. Um, and that emotion must be at such a level that is driven by their belief in the message of the play. They really have to not just say, oh, I'm doing this play because it's making money and I see it's making money. It has to be deeper. And so Gabler makes this point here. They're the most frightened people in the world made really by a, a screenwriter. The writer is saying, the writer is saying the producers are very fragile people. And as a writer, when you have a message in your play, you have to make sure the producer does not compromise that message. You have to make sure the producer that does not compromise that message. And shout out to Neil Gabler for conveying the messages of particular plays, namely the jazz singer, um, namely uh, Checkout, namely Citizen Kane. Um, there were some films that he described their adaptation to the film from the stage in such a way where you as the reader understood the importance of keeping the message, the importance of the film genre to keep the original message of the play. Um, I recently saw the film version of Leslie Lee's play, The First Breeze of Summer, that was performed on stage. And it was the scene where Lucretia, uh, who's based on Leslie Lee's actual grandmother, um, tells um, one of the fathers of her children, um, her white father, that um, she won't be able to see him again when he basically explains to her why he has to leave. And the film conveyed that very strong emotion that I felt when I saw the staged version, the same emotion I felt when I saw the staged version um, is what I felt when I saw the film version, thanks to powerful acting. The stage version was with Yaya da Costa, and then uh, an amazing actor played Brighton Woodward in the stage version. The actor's name is not coming to me. The film actor who played Brighton Woodward is Anthony McKay, and he was absolutely amazing. And I remember that that very strong emotion. I felt watching the film, I got um, also watching the play. I saw the play in 2008, uh, The First Breeze of Summer with my aunt Iona and I was moved. And, and, and it was like the universe was just guiding me because literally like within a year after seeing the play on stage, I walked into the drum bookshop that was then on 40th Street and 8th Avenue. And I saw a flyer from the Negro Ensemble Company um, advertising a playwriting workshop directed by Leslie Lee. And I was like, oh, I'm going. And that's how I started going. And I finished my third play there. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm appreciative for the work of Leslie Lee. Shout out to Neil Gabler. Thank you for conveying the meaning of plays novels and absolutely films in your work as a film historian, your training as a film historian. Thank you, Neil Gabler, for writing this important book called um, An Empire of Their Own. Um, last part about this that I wanted to really look at, this is the very last page um, of, the, of the epilogue. He has like a three-page epilogue. It's a short epilogue. Gabler writes, and so the empires have crumbled. The moguls' names have faded. The estates are gone and the power and the panache and the fear. But what the Hollywood Jews left behind is something powerful and mysterious. What remains is a spell, a landscape of the mind, a constellation of values, attitudes, and images, a history and a mythology that is part of our culture and consciousness. What remains is the America of our imagination and theirs. Out of their desperation and their dreams, they gave us this America. Out of their desperation and dreams, they lost themselves. While that may be true, I wanted him to talk about how the people who've taken over um, these studios um, have the same mentality, you know, to just feed the industry and how that mentality, what it takes to run a film studio, 
has not changed, even though um, the men who started them died off or died in poverty. Um, um, he, he tells a gripping story of how one of them, whose name is not coming to me, dies with the IRS hounding him. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much. Excuse me, Neil Gabler for writing this amazing story. Um, since I last passed, since I last um, was able to do my 25th YouTube, Irene Cara passed and talk about, wow, emotional strength. I just saw a beautiful photo of her and the original Sparkle cast, the 1976 film, which I highly recommend, which I thought was a better screenplay. I'm a writer. So I'm listening for the screenplay. I'm listening for the story. The story of Sparkle, the 76 Sparkle, is much stronger than the more updated Sparkle with Jordan Sparks and Whitney Houston because that original Sparkle with Irene Cara as Sparkle um, gave more agency to the artist and to the manager, where the manager was really looking out for the artist, you know. Um, now, in, in the in the version where Derek Luke plays the um, the manager that was originally played by uh, Philip Michael Thomas in the '76 film, the way that the manager role is written in the remake is so Barry Gordy, instant Barry Gordy, and I was like, this is not realistic. So non-realistic. The 76 was written so like, wow. Joel Schumacher, I noticed according to Wikipedia, uh, wrote the screenplay for that original one. Oh my gosh, her performance shines, but nowhere does Irene Cara's performance shine and affect me emotionally like it did in Roots, The Next Generation. I don't know what it was about her on-screen chemistry because Dorian Her Herewood uh, plays the boyfriend in the Sparkle film of Sparkle's older sister, um, who's abusive. But in Roots of Next Generation, he plays Alex Haley's father. And Irene Cara plays I Alex Haley's m mother, Bertha. What a performance. I just put on one of the few, I hadn't posted in a long time, but one of the few things I did post was that scene that mm, moves me emotionally, sexually between Irene Cara and Dorian Harewood when he's going off to fight in World War I. And that kind of chemistry is like, wow. Because it reminded me of watching a wedding band on stage at the Theater for a New Audience in Brooklyn, New York in April. No, in May, I saw that stage production. And the actors were just, I know it was post quarantining, but it was just, there was no physical chemistry. When I saw this again, I was like, I was blown away by the strong physical chemistry between Dorian Harewood, uh, who plays Sam Haley, and Irene Cara, who played Bertha Haley, Alex Haley's mother. And what a performance. Um, Irene Cara has a hold on my soul. Um, not only am I sexually attracted to her, she's gorgeous. But there's something about her emotions that just want, <laughs> makes me, I don't know if it's the masculine instinct in me. I just want to comfort her. And I'm like, babe, you can't feel bad. Okay, babe, I want to, you just want to, for me, when I see Irene Cara, I want to meet her needs. I want to like, what can I do for you, babe? I'm sorry, babe. I don't want you to feel bad, babe. Are you okay, babe? I want to say babe, like after, because that's how she performed the role of Bertha Haley, like somebody who's in need to be seen, who needs to be seen, felt, heard, protected. And uh, she, she made me want to do that. For some reason, I lose it emotionally when she, um, after she kisses, um, uh, Sam, and she goes to the end of the train, she waves bye, I'll miss you, I'm bawling with her. I'm like, who had this impact on me? Who had this emotional hold on me? Probably nobody except Cynthia Erivo when she did Harriet had that kind of emotional hold on me that Irene Cara had. Irene, Irene Cara had a hold on me. Like, why am I feeling everything she feels? And I found out she's a Pisces. And I was like, okay. And, uh, you know, because my mom's Pisces. 
Um, and I was like, I feel this very deep affinity. Um, and then, you know, she was basically shut out of the industry after the 80s because she stood up for herself. So what an example. Thank you, Irene Kara, for your example, for your work, for Sparkle, for Roots the Next, Roots the Next Generation, for taking your producers to court when they would not pay you properly. Thank you, Irene Kara, for your example. Thank you for your work in Flashdance, which I really didn't get to uh, appreciate. Uh, not more than this. This is this. I think is her best work. She has a beautiful scene where she's basically complaining to um, her mother about how history. You know, I don't want to know about history. Her character, Bertha, is the name of her character. Says, "Oh, I don't know. Oh, I don't care about history." And I'm like, that is the mentality of most people that the whole root series was trying to combat. So shout out to Irene Kara. Thank you for your amazing work. God bless you for it. Um, today, December 12th, oh, just yesterday, well, most of this YouTube live has been recorded during December 12th, which is the birthday of Michael Battle. Michael Battle is the author of Desmond Tutu, a spiritual biography of South Africa's confessor. I had the honor of being on the 2022 Tutu Travel Seminar, where they show very significant, historically significant parts of Cape Town, South Africa, um, that relate to Desmond Tutu's life. And I read this biography and wow, it left a mark on me. There's certain things that, like the Roots Next Generation series, I'll never forget. One of the things that left a mark on me was <sighs> the way Desmond Tutu supported Nelson Mandela, the way that he also got support from white parishioners, um, just the way that he was a leader and the way that he wrote about Steve Biko, his, he hand wrote everything that he thought it seemed like and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that he worked with um, after the election of Nelson Mandela just gave the world so much hope. So thank you, Desmond Tutu, for your life. Thank you, Michael Battle, for organizing an amazing travel seminar about the life of Desmond Tutu. Um, I'm most grateful for it. And then um, finally, oh, by the way, please, if you haven't already, like, share, and subscribe my YouTube. Um, please, this is my 26th YouTube. I'm getting the word out there. And my cash app is dollar sign Ron Fraser. <clears throat> R-H-O-N-E-F-R-A-S-E-R is my cash app. Um, interesting thing about this book, I also remember a slight um, that Battle writes about from Tabo and Becky um, to Desmond Tutu. He tried to like downplay the influence of Tutu when everybody reading knows, no, he's much more influential than Mbeki is um, trying to give him credit for. So we thank Michael Battle for documenting documenting um, the impact of Desmond Tutu on the world. The example he set about the role of the church and state, the role of the church in the state. The church is pushing the state to be responsible and to serve the people is the role of the church that Michael Battle writes um, in, in, in his biography. I highly recommend his biography. Last thing, um, since my last YouTube, so much has developed about Victor Bout, who Russia got as the United States welcomed Brittany Griner home. I'm glad to read that Brittany Griner is home. Um, I know that you have to be more responsible and considerate as a U.S. citizen going to other countries. I had a friend of mine just send me a link about how a um, journalist was jailed and died in custody over LGBTQ rights. He stood up for rights, but he went to a country where it's against the law, uh, Qatar, where the World Cup is. So I see, a t I see a relationship, a deep relationship between that journalist being detained and dying in prison in Qatar and Brittany Griner coming home. We have to, we can't be like the ugly American in the world is the lesson that I'm getting from both of those cases. Do not go into other countries with anything that can be suspected of um, dangerous. You know, she went in with cannabis oil. 
generally, as a general rule of thumb, I don't go to any other countries with stuff that customs could pick up and question me on. You just don't do that. You you get any substances that you'd like to use in the countries you visit, not in the cust, not in the airport. So it's just an opportunity to just, as a citizen, be on my best behavior when visiting other countries. Jackie Lukeman breaks down perfectly, breaks down perfectly the outrage over Victor Bout and how that outrage exposes what Jackie Lukeman calls hypocrisy and anti-intellectualism. She makes an incredible point that I want to read where she says, you have heat for Victor Booth, um, Victor Booth, but you don't, don't have as much heat for the U.S. government that is creating the conflicts that cause people like a Victor Bout to come up and, and to sell arms because the U.S. is the number one arms dealer in the world. So thank you, Jackie Lukeman, for pointing that out. Make sure you check out her Black Power Media um, work. And this concludes my 26 YouTube. Please subscribe, like, and share. Keep reading and keep the faith.